Welcome, this is a Johnny Vedmore read-through, and I'm going to read through an article of mine called The Potting Identity, which is part of a series. A series is going to expand, and in Christmas we'll have a, the start of a four-part series, four-series documentary, at least four series, mapped and planned out. And the first series is nearly all produced, a uh, documentary series that will be cut up into parts um that is going to be about this is it's going to be a very long epstein documentary by the end of it um but the first part's going to be uh based around this the potting our identity an extremely important article never expected to write didn't know anything about pottinger this is about a man who's called john stanley pottinger and john stanley pottinger is an extremely important person within the epstein case for he is one of the epstein's victims lawyer or was was just before this article come out and they knew this article was coming out he stepped down and i'm not surprised he sat down because he's not all he says he is in fact he is a member or was a member of the cia and that seems very obvious um and one of the people who constructed the second Epstein case. Remember, the first one was a complete fit-up. It was meant for Epstein to have an open-door prison cell, walk in and out when he wanted to, and it looked like he got some... The, 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 the victims got some sort of justice, or a victim, two victims, I think it was in that case, that got some sort of justice. Well, obviously, times have changed and things have happened in between there, haven't they? And now we're at a stage where when you investigate it, you realise there's a lot more that hasn't been said, loads. In actual Actual fact has been um, an idea painted of the Epstein case, and a lot of it is not true. When people point at the Mossad, you got to say, wait one second. If it was a Mossad, then why is everybody who raised him connected with him and protected him the CIA? So we're going to go into this, uh, the first, and I'm going to share my screen with you for the first of this read through. And I'm really looking forward to, to reading this because it's been a while since I've... Um, uh, looked at this I've, I've of course you know been organizing the uh documentary producing it right in the music it's got a mean soundtrack i gotta say from pong wong is one of my favorite songs so far um it got a really mean soundtrack it's gonna be epic i really mean epic i'm really looking forward to this um coming out uh around christmas and in the first part these are the main I mean, some of the main players, there's loads of people in this. But on the front of cover here, you see George H.W. Bush. Uh, you see Richard Nixon, Martin Luther King Jr., um, Gerald Ford, and, of course, Orlando Letelier. If you don't know who Orlando Letelier is, well, you will by the end of this, and you will know even more by the end of the documentary. And this is called, this is on newspaste.com. It's called... The Pottinger Identity, The Road to the Takedown of Jeffrey Epstein by Johnny Fedmore. J. Stanley Pottinger is best known today as one of the most prominent lawyers representing victims of infamous billionaire intelligence asset and pedophile sex trafficker Jeffrey Epstein. As a former member of the Nixon and Ford administrations, J. Stanley Pottinger has also played a central role in some of the most infamous official cover-ups to take place over the last 50 years. Prepare yourself, for this series won't only expose Pottinger's extremely influential and close relationship to government, the Republican Party, and the CIA. It will also rewrite American history. Yeah, man. Such a, I, I mean, I got to say beforehand, uh, even even going to read this gives me like quivers. I spent a year of my life researching and writing these three articles, and uh, and my life changed because of these articles. Much of my life changed because of these articles. Things I found out in these articles literally destroyed large parts of my life. And one day, people will understand. Um, what you have to do to report the truth and what you have to go through and who you have to work with and who you have to be next to and all of the other things. It's not as easy as you think. 
It really isn't as easy as you think. You can you can speak the truth over and over again, but once you start investigating, once you start finding the things that no one else wants you to find, then you discover people's metal, what they're made of. Here we go. John Stanley Pottinger was born on the 13th of February, 1940, to Eleanor and John Pottinger, who were from Dayton, Ohio. Stanley's father, John Pottinger Sr., had been born and raised in Racine, Racine, I think it says, Wisconsin, and went on to study at the University of Cincinnati in Connecticut. After his studies, John Pottinger Sr. soon became a very significant and influential member of the Dayton business community and very active in local civic affairs. He was eventually elected as a city commissioner of Dayton, a, a position he held until his death at the age of 48. Only 48. Pottinger Sr. was also an in the insurance business. Pottinger Sr. was also in the insurance business and was the president of his own firm, John Pottinger & Co. Insurance Agency. He was regularly awarded by the elites of Dayton community with membership of such organizations as the Rotary Club, the Dayton City Club, and the Shrine Club. He was a Freemason at the John Durst Lodge, as well as being part of the Scottish Rite, described as one of the appendant bodies of Freemasonry that a master mason must join for further exposure to the principles of Freemasonry. He was also active in the Dayton Chamber of Commerce at Wilbur Wright PTA, Dayton Better Business Bureau, and the Airway Improvement Association, to name just a handful. John Pottinger Sr. was a yachtsman who not only entered competitive events locally, but also traveled around the world, including sailing around Europe and to Russia during the peak of the Cold War. Even with all those many different exploits, he still found a time to be the donor uh, to be the donor of the John Pottinger Trophy, which was presented annually to the member of the Dayton business community who did the most to advance world trade. John Pottinger had two very interesting sons, one being J. Stanley Pottinger, as he would preferably be called, who was exemplary student and was continuously recognized for his keen intellect, being rewarded with various positions and titles throughout his youth. In May 1952, Pottinger was in, uh, in the sixth grade at Washington School, where he was elected president of the elementary school division, which saw a fresh-faced Pottinger's picture appear in the local, local Dayton Daily News. In 1955, he became selected as one of the five youths from Dayton to attend the Baptist World Alliance event, on which was being held in London that year. Pottinger represented Wilbur Wright Middle School for Buckeye Boys State in the spring of 1957, where he was the president of, the junior, of his junior class and played the lead in the junior class play. In November of the same year, the young Stanley Pottinger was selected to be one of the 10 most typical teenagers during the Optimist Club's Youth Appreciation Week, chosen out of a potential 550 candidates who had been entered. By that time, Pottinger was a senior at Wilbur Wright in Dayton. He was co-captain of the football team, an honour student, the chairman of the Committee of Committees of Senior Class, and was the sports editor of the Wright Pilot student, uh, school student publication. He was a top student, a keen athlete, and like his father, he was on the path towards greatness. For Americans living through the 1950s, the prevailing East versus West Cold War dynamic of the era heavily influenced their everyday lives. A litany of youth programs were created throughout this period, which were laser focused on the frosty democratic American and Soviet Russian relationship. During the summer of 1957, Stanley Pottinger traveled to Soviet Russia alongside his parents, and on his return, it was reported that the young Pottinger was busy giving illustrated talks to adult groups on his impressions on the other side of the Iron Curtain. It was clear that J. Stanley Pottinger had an interest in going into government service from early on, as well as all the accolades he had received for his hard work at school. He also attended events such as the Student Government Day, an event where high school students assumed the role of government officials and was sponsored by the Junior Chambers of Commerce. In 1958, John Pottinger, Stanley's father, was serving in the city commissioner, serving as the city commissioner, and the family were living on 124 Murray Drive. 
The young Pottinger's continuous success must have pleased his city official father, especially when Stan Pottinger served as a student mayor of Dayton and soon after was chosen as Wilbur Wright's representative senior. Pottinger was now the all-city quarterback of the football team, a track athlete, president of the junior Civitan uh, Services Club, chairman of the board of the senior class, president of the National Honor Society, and voted the outstanding senior by his classmates. Also in 1958, a young Stanley Pottinger traveled with his father to the Caribbean, where he served as a crew on a sloop. This was to be the last voyage the pair took together. Stanley Pottinger was mentioned on the 2nd of December 1958 visiting his sick father in hospital, where he delivered a letter from the other four city commissioners wishing him speedy recovery from his illness. It was reported on 5th of December 1958 that John Pottinger was about to undergo a complicated cardiac operation targeting two of his heart valves. The following day, it was announced that John Pottinger, Stanley's father, suffered a fatal heart attack and had died during heart surgery at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. John Pottinger was the fourth Dayton commi City Commissioner in a row to die while, while in office. That's insane, isn't it? Fourth in a row. There he is. That's his father. John Pottinger, 48, dies after heart surgery. City Commissioner, ailing most of the year. Most of year. Church conducted chain of prayer. City Commissioner Don, John Pottinger, who underwent surgery to, for repair of a heart defect at 7.30 uh, a.m. yesterday, died at 11.25 a.m. at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Mr. Pottinger, 48, was president of Pottinger & Co. Insurance Company. He took office last January after being elected in November 1957. The commissioner had been in poor health most of this year and last met with commissioners August 6. In past months, he underwent numerous medical tests, both at Miami Valley Hospital and Mayo Clinic. Pottinger was heading to enrollment at DePauw University after graduation, where he uh, planned to major in economics, but Harvard soon beckoned him instead. At Harvard, he flourished, meeting students from all over America and the world, stated the freshman Pottinger about his first-term experiences at the prestigious university. He also described to his hometown newspaper how it was to attend lectures by the same professors who had written his textbooks. My government lecturer um, drafted the Weimar Republic's constitution, and another is a government budget advisor, Pottinger went on to say. Harvard has no fraternities, but there are special interest clubs for everything from acting to parachute jumping and more. Pottinger wasn't interested in normal extracurricular activities open to the usual Harvard student. Instead, in March 1959, he was to be the only freshman appointed to a special eight-man committee of the Harvard Student Council set up to consider all aspects of the university's athletic program. While at Harvard, Pottinger built up a strong friendship with Navy ensign William Stuart Parsons, eventually becoming best man when Parsons got married in 1962, a year which was very eventful for the Pottinger family in general. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, right. You know, when you, when you um, research an article, when you write and research an article and you go through it like this and you you reread it. it it gives you an all sorts of sense of feelings and excitement um because this i i mean i wasn't expecting to find everything that i found you know no one ever quite work it knows what they're going to find when they're investigating that's the way it works that's the way investigating works um but yeah i didn't expect to find this so here we go oh brother where art thou then came the case involving the disappearance of David Forbes Pottinger, J. Stanley Pottinger's brother, who had been treading in the footsteps of their late father after he'd become a Dayton com city commissioner. On the 1st of August 1962, David F. Pottinger attended a commission meeting and by the following morning he was de declared officially missing, with Dayton police launching an all-out search and expressing their concern of foul play being involved while Pottinger was on the pot uh, while working working on the assumption that violence was committed. At 8am on the morning of the 2nd of August 1962, David Pottinger's car was spotted with blood in East Dayton, six blocks from his house. However, soon after, the police also declared um, that the trail of blood which had been found had lost its significance. 
One of David Pottinger's shoes was discovered a few miles from the vehicle, and investigators also recovered a white T-shirt which was found laying in the street nearby. Here's a picture of John Stanley Pottinger here with police investigators uh, as they go on the search for the missing brother. Stanley Pottinger was very quickly on the scene to help with the investigations. He told the press that his brother had been carrying over $2,000 in cash, apparently to close a deal on a house. David Pottinger's wife had become concerned for his safety when he failed to return home. She waited until 3 a.m. to inform Pottinger's mother, with Stanley Pottinger raising the alarm with the police at 5 a.m. The police questioned a waitress working at Stockyards Cafe where, near to where Pottinger's car had been found. She stated to police that the man fitting his description had purchased three cans of beer at 11pm to take away with him, leaving at about midnight. The police found two empty cans of the same brand as the waitress had sold him nearby Pottinger's car. Soon the neighbourhood was being intensively searched for clues. Police checked gardens, garages, basements and bushes, while light aircraft circled the area above, and the local authorities were soon considering calling in the FBI. Within days of his disappearance, 300 Boy Scouts had been organised to twice comb a 16-square-mile area of East Dayton while Stanley Pottinger was busy searching his brother's private offices for clues at the nearby Talbot Towers. Soon, rumours were circulating that the family had heard from their missing relation, with Stanley Pottinger forced to make a statement to the press to quash the supposed hearsay, stating, I wish it was true. We've had no word or idea of what's happened to him, but we're still optimistic. It's difficult to feel that way under the circumstances, but we're trying to keep our hopes up. The rumours of David Pottinger contacting his relative became more detailed with the Journal Herald reporting that Sergeant Peake, who had been tasked with investigating the Commissioner's strange disappearance, had checked out two anonymous phone calls which said that Commissioner Pottinger had called his family and was going to Jamaica. In fact, the situation was becoming more and more complicated by the day and it was only going to get worse. It was soon being reported that David Forbes Pottinger had actually run off with the 17-year-old babysitter of his children, Cheryl Sherry Vanderval, who had also been reported missing. Witnesses stated that the Kettering teenager had been meeting the city commissioner at frequent intervals after school prior to their disappearance, and that David Pottinger had also been frequenting the various restaurants and bars um, at nearby Silver Lake and Crystal Lake with women other than his wife. Stanley Pottinger labelled these revelations as a lie, stating, we won't dignify these lies by talking about them. However, the evidence was mounting up against Stanley's sibling. Friends of the missing schoolgirl gave statements to the police, which described a flourishing relationship between David Pottinger and Sherry Vanderbilt. On the 7th of August 1962, Stanley Pottinger was interviewed at police headquarters in Dayton alongside Pottinger's stepfather, James D. Chittenden, but the line of questioning was not revealed. On the 17th of September 1962, an Ohio-based Akron Beacon Journal published an article entitled Missing Dayton Official Found in Tennessee Ditch which reported that David F. Pottinger had been found alive in a ditch in Tennessee. He was swiftly taken to a university hospital where he was said to be suffering from amnesia. Even though Pottinger had claimed to have amnesia, his memory loss appeared to be rather selective, with the aforementioned Ohio-based newspaper reporting that a 26-year-old had told a tale of being beaten by three men in an investigation of gambling and prostitution he had been conducting. The news spread like wildfire that the missing Dayton City Commissioner had been found alive and well in a ditch 46 days after his disappearance. The Kansas City Star reported that Pottinger said the gambling scandal in Dayton prompted him to begin a private and unofficial investigation of alleged rackets, going on to state he contacted many persons who had information but failed to find anyone willing to testify until receiving a Phone call from a man, August 1st. He said the man told Pottinger he could supply information but needed money. Even though he could explain the events which supposedly led to this bout of amnesia, Pottinger claimed not to know where he had been or what had happened to him since his disappearance. The following day, intrigued newspapers reported that Pottinger had found a muddy was found in a muddy roadside ditch with a minor scalp wound. Pottinger travelled back to Dayton after his brief hospital stay, with his wife and family picking, up, uh, picking him up in a rented automobile to take him home. 
He was only allowed to be released from hospital in Knoxville if he agreed to be admitted to St. Elizabeth Hospital in Dayton for further tests and for the authorities to be able to question him further. Police inspector Claire Martz was uh, standing by to question Pottinger, stating, we'll be in touch with Pottinger, and going on to say that they wanted to speak to him for strictly routine investigation. Pottinger was claiming that the rendezvous with the informant, he had taken £2,100 from the office safe in case he had, he had to pay for um, the information that that the rendezvous. Supposedly, he had arrived to the pre-designated meeting point when three men dragged him from his car, beat him up and fled with the money. Bastards. On the 20th of September, Portiga underwent a series of neurological tests, as well as examinations determine, to determine if he was suffering from any nervous disorder. When asked whether or not Pottinger's claims of suffering from amnesia could be substantiated, his doctor stated, That is a very difficult question. I think the only evidence is that he had suffered amnesia, is that he, he claims to remember nothing. There's little objective evidence that he has had amnesia, but this would be true in many such cases. However, potting his claims of amnesia aside, there were originally two people who had supposedly gone missing, and the babysitter was also resurfacing at the same time. The Lancaster Eagle Gazette reported on the 19th of September that New York police had been asking, uh, had been asked to detain Sherry Vanderval after her family admitted they had received communication from the 17-year-old. Her family stated that on the 8th of September, Cheryl had written to them from New York asking for her mother to send her a package of clothing. The Kettering Police Chief, J John Shyrock, gave the New York police the order number for the package of clothing, but Cheryl was soon heading out of New York and on her way to stay with L. Von D. Sewell, a member of her family in Alexandria near Washington, D.C. On the 25th of September 1962, the Daily Advocate reported that David Pottinger was undergoing psychiatric examination and that Dr. Bernard M. Coeur was conducting the tests. By this time, a complete investigation and disclosure of the case had been called for by, the data, by Dayton's Mayor Frank R. Summers and the city manager Herbert Starrick. Finally, on Friday the 28th of September 1962, it was announced that police were allowed to question David Pottinger on the following Monday, and by the 1st of October, Pottinger's story began to quickly unravel. Cheryl Vanderveel returned home to her family in suburban Kettering and announced that she had been with Pottinger the entire time that she was missing. The police captain named Richard Grundish gave his account of the girl's statement in the Kansas City Star. Pottinger went to Port Clinton after leaving his blood-stained car and only and one shoe in Dayton Cafe parking lot. Two days later, he met Cheryl in Springfield with a car he had purchased in Middletown, under an assumed name. From there, they drove to the East Coast, where Pottinger bought an 18-foot boat at Oxford, Maryland, and they spent weeks cruising along the eastern coast, finally selling the boat in Falmouth, Massachusetts. Pottinger had not only taken the £2,100 from his office, he had also borrowed around $3,500, sorry, dollars, I meant to say, uh, shortly after his disappearance. Stanley Pottinger's brother had groomed a minor for sex, trafficked her across state lines, and made plans with her, which began to unravel within a couple of months. Mm, trafficking trafficking girl, young girls for sex, underage girls for sex. Anybody else? Anybody else you know who did that in America? The East Coast? Hmm? Here he is, David Forbes' partner. This, repeated, this appealed, appeared in the newspaper, the next to each other. Pottinger was facing a formal charge of violating the Mann Act, a white slave traffic act, which made it a felony to engage in interstate or foreign commerce transport of any woman or girl for the purpose of prostitution or debauchery or for any other immoral purpose. However, on the 3rd of October, the U.S. Attorney, uh, uh, Attorney's Office refused to file a formal charge of the Mann Act violation against Pottinger. The Assistant U.S. Attorney, Ronald Logan, stated, there is, of course, a technical violation of the Man Act. If the girl's statement is true, that she was with Pottinger for 40-something days in his absence, and if they were together in various states at various times. Regardless of which law could be enforced, the police were indicating that Pottinger was still going to face criminal charges. 
Inspector Martz soon announced that they were planning to charge Pottinger with a lesser charge of contributing to the delinquency of a minor, which came with a maximum penalty of a $1,000 fine and a year in the workhouse. On the 4th of October 1962, Pottinger admitted that the stories he had given about being beaten and suffering amnesia were lies. While Pottinger waited for his trial, his previous position as commis city commissioner was being hotly contested, with 11 candidates publicised as trying out for the role. By 12th of October, he had been it, it had been decided that David Pottinger was to be arraigned in juvenile court. But when this was happened when this was to happen was left to the court along with pottinger's attorneys and doctors over a few over just over a week later pottinger initially pleaded guilt innocent sorry uh to free uh count charge which the media reported has included acting in a manner tending to cause a delinquency involving um the pottinger babysitter Frank Nichol, a juvenile court judge overseeing the case, appointed a psychiatrist to evaluate Pottinger's mental state. However, two days later, on the 22nd of October, his personal psychiatrist, Dr. Bernard M. Coeur, told the judge that David Pottinger was competent to participate in his own defence, even though he was to remain under psychiatric treatment at Miami Valley Hospital. Curiously, the juvenile court judge confirmed that no trial date had been set and that no jury had been requested. He even went as far as saying that, as far as I know, there will be there will not be a trial. In fact, a supposed victim in the case, the wayward Cheryl Vanderfile, was reported as leaving the city by her attorney, Glenn Mumpower, who refused to give her attend intended destination to the press. Eventually, the trial of David Pottinger was announced to take place on the 29th of November. Nine days after the announcement of the trial, on the 14th of October, uh, November 1962, Pottinger was released from the psychiatric ward where he was staying for six weeks in total. David Pottinger's attorney originally entered a plea of not guilty on the delinquency charge, and if the case went to trial, he was heading towards the maximum sentence. On the 15th of November, he was admitted to Harding Sanatorium in Worthing, where he was uh, expected to continue his treatment. However, on the 21st of November, the Dayton Daily News reported, a nervous David F. Pottinger appeared in juvenile uh, court today to plead no contest to two of the three charges stemming from his tryst with a teenage babysitter. David Pottinger's ruse had officially and abruptly come to its eventual climax, with the latter article stating, the second phase of the Pottinger case began with the announcement through his attorney that his, the, his disappearance and the tale of amnesia and his personal assault were a hoax. Pottinger was sentenced to $1,000 probation, um, and five years, but a one thousand dollar probation and five years probation. Ooh, I, spelling mistake. By the Montgomery County Juvenile Court, overseeing uh, the debar the debacle of a case. The decision of whether to further indict Pottinger came almost a week after he appeared in juvenile court. The Butler Grand Jury failed to return any indictment against the former city commissioner on the charge that he uh, used a false name to obtain legal documents um, for a vehicle used during his escapade. The jury had been given evidence that Pottinger had used a fictitious name in purchasing the car in Middletown. However, on the 31st of July 1962, County Prosecutor Robert Mars failed to convince jury to indict Although David F. Pottinger was not heading to the workhouse, he was also not destined to return to public office either. On the 1st of May 1963, about six months after his conviction, it was announced in the Journal Herald headline that David Pottinger and family moved to Florida. However, David F. Pottinger's luck didn't seem to improve, and by the summer of the same year, the Dayton Daily News was reporting on him running aground a boat owned by um, a Mr. and Mrs. Russell Boaz with a short report entitled, Pottinger Skippered Mired Schooner. <laughs> oh, David. J. Stanley Pottinger's Rise to Power. John Stanley Pottinger had ducked out of ducked out of the view of press halfway through the debacle surrounding his disappearing brother David. He returned to Harvard University to study law, eventually receiving his Bachelor of Arts degree in 1965. After graduating from Harvard Law School, 
Pottinger began practicing law, taking up uh, a position as general counsel for Broad, Busterud and Curry, which would later become Broad, Curry and Schultz, based out of San Francisco. In 1966, Pottinger is noted as counsel representing the condemned man, Dovey Carl Maffis, convicted, of murder, convicted in the murder of Vernon Ray. But during this period, Pottinger was also looking for a way into government service. In 1967, he was reported. It was reported that John Stanley Pottinger, or J. Stanley Pottinger, was the lawyer and county committee counsel for the Republican Party. An article in the San Francisco Examiner at the time touted Pottinger as a potential candidate to replace Democrat um, Charles W. Mayer's vacated um, state assembly seat. In fact, Stanley Pottinger was representing the state Republican Central Committee during this period and was about to catch a break he had been searching for. In December 1969, Pottinger was appointed as regional attorney in San Francisco for the Department of Health, Education and Welfare, HEW. By March 1970, J. Stanley Pottinger was part of Richard Nixon's team, which toured south, the South, enunciating, desegre enunciating desegregation policy. He was appointed to this position by Robert H. Finch, H. Finch, the HEW secretary, with Finch saying that Pottinger was committed unequivocally to a for enforcement of the constitutional and statutory law relating to civil rights. He was soon being reported in New York Times as a director of the Office for Civil Rights in the Department of Health, Education and Welfare. Pottinger had replaced Leon E. Panetta, who had been dismissed months earlier as the latter, uh, for, as the latter article mentions, moving ahead on, of administration policy on desegregation. Panetta's dismissal had been followed by resignations, and more than one third of the staff members of the Office for Civil Rights send in uh, with, uh, and more than one third of the staff members for the Office of Civil Rights sending a letter to Nixon stating their bitter disappointment. Pottinger had reportedly been active in the California Republican Party by this period in history, including publicly supporting Nixon's 1968 presidential campaign. Pottinger went straight to work in his new role within the Nixon administration, stating in April 1970, we have striven uh, mightily to eliminate all black schools and we will continue to do so. Our policy on that has not changed a bit. Also in April 1970, the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, Jerris Leonard, brought Pottinger and Jerry Brader, the Director of the Division for Equal Educational Opportunities for the Department of HEW, with him to South Carolina to meet the local and state officials about the continued segregation of schools throughout the South. And there he is during that period, J. Stanley Pottinger, Popper Nixon man. In fact, over the following year, Pottinger issued warning to warnings to various districts in South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida, Kentucky, Tennessee, Delaware, Maryland, and Texas, among others. However, it wasn't only the American South which found itself under investigation by Pottinger's team. With the enforcement of desegregation policy, unexpected consequences in other states were also manifesting. By 1972, segregation in border state schools had increased slightly with Pottinger admitting to reporters that the reasons why this was occurring were unknown, stating, I just don't know why. We're going to have to check it out. In his position as Director of Civil Rights Division of the um, Department of Health, Education and Welfare, Pottinger wasn't only supposedly championing the desegregation of American schools, he was also involved in the gender equality movement. In June 1971, it was reported that complaints had been filed with the federal government against some of the top universities in America. Brown, Harvard, Yale and Stanford were among the big names, accused of hiring and promoting male staff ahead of female workers. Potter, Pottinger himself argued that sex discrimination had become a substantive issue since women activists started pressing for enforcement of presidential order of 1968 prohibiting sexual discrimination by government contractors. It is also during this period that J. Stanley Pottinger began to have sexual relationship with a known CIA asset, a relationship that will be thoroughly examined in the second part of this series. Yes, it will. 
Pottinger was also dealing with supposed discrimination against white people. In January 1973, his department began investigating accusations of reverse discrimination after receiving a total of 52 examples from six national Jewish organizations, Agudaf Israel of America, the American Jewish Committee, the American Jewish Congress, the Anti-Defamation League of Ben Ibrif, and the Jewish Lacour Committee, and the Jewish War Veterans um, sent the examples of reverse racism against white male applicants. One of the examples given by the various Jewish organizations cited the advertisement by sociology department of William College for an Afro-American with PhD and teaching experience. You know, they didn't like um, black people getting jobs. Turns out. Don't talk about that now. Um, as we'll see, this is the um, Oglala Sioux, uh, American Indian movement here. Um at Wounded Knee. Extremely interesting picture there. Extremely interesting. In February 1973, the Wounded Knee occupation began when around 200 Oglala Lakota and uh, members of the American Indian Movement occupied a town of Wounded Knee in the Pine, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation located in South Dakota. A standoff ensued between the insurgents and supporters of a local controversial tribal president, Richard Wilson. The election of Wilson was considered to be fraudulent by most observers. He was accused of buying votes with the help of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, BIA, as well as bringing non-residents in to vote for him. Opponents of Wilson lost their jobs and were harassed. An Un Arbor Sun article from 25th of April 1975 entitled Reign of Terror at Wounded Knee reported that two years later the situation was still tense. Legal workers and attorneys had been pulled from cars, brutalized and assaulted with weapons by Wilson and his now infamous goon squad. Since the beginning of March 11th, people have been killed on the Pine Ridge Reservation, most of them AIM supporters. Wounded Knee was the site of an 1890 massacre of 300 unarmed Lakota people. The memory of this event seemed to help catalyze the standoff. The protesters criticized the U.S. government's failure to fulfill their treaties with various indigenous people of the United States, and they demanded a reopening and treaty negotiations. The retaliation by the government against the protesters was emblematic of the Nixon era. Initially, the government flew in J. Stanley Pottinger to deal with the negotiation process. As Pottinger made his way out of Washington to deal with the crisis, he commented on the situation, stating that he was concerned as a negotiator that the option I re represent to negotiate the settlement was uh, not involving force had come to an end. These veiled threats from Pottinger came as residents who had been ousted by the insurgents threatened to make a move against the protesters. A, the tribal leader, Richard Wilson, who was cited as the main reason for the insurgency, why the insurgency began, publicly backed a tribal attack against the insurgents, threatening that uh, that their attack would happen with whatever necessary. The aforementioned Ann Arbor Sun article gives us an idea of the strategy implemented by Pottinger after the initial negotiations failed. The government clearly intended to punish the protesters. Two years after the occupation, one might ask, why has the government spent more than two years and millions of dollars trying to convict these people? Why is the government continuing to prosecute over a, uh, after over 80 cases have been won on acquittal or dismissed by the court? Why has a reign of terror begun which in which 11 people have been killed on the Pine Ridge Reservation in the past month alone? Why were over 20 American Indian movement leaders arrested within 48 hours of each other last March? Around the same time as the standoff at Wounded Knee began, Stanley Pottinger was also central to the conclusion of another official investigation into, national, uh, into a national controversy. In May 1970, 28 National Guard soldiers fired about 67 rounds over 13 seconds, killing four students and wounding nine others. From April 1973, it was being reported that Pottinger was being put in charge of investigating the fatal shooting on behalf of the Justice Department. Soon after, Pottinger referred the case surrounding what is now commonly referred to as the Kent State Massacre to a grand jury. 
By this time, the newly promoted Assistant Attorney General, J. Stanley Pottinger, made it clear that the decision to send the case to the grand jury um, did not mean a guilty verdict was expected or sought, saying... This action doesn't mean that we have made the decision to seek indictments. The case had originally been dropped by the former uh, Attorney General John N. Mitchell on August 1971, with Mitchell stating that there was insufficient evidence to warrant a hearing by the grand jury. Pottinger sought the permission of the successor to Mitchell, Attorney General Elliot L. Richardson, to reopen the investigation in August of that year, with the approval being granted to re-examine any new evidence. By March 1974, eight members of the National Guard of Ohio who were involved in Kent State Massacre were indicted by the grand jury, which stated there was no conspiracy found. The 20 men and women of the grand jury did not cite any of the Guard officers or government officials who had been criticized in any uh, in other private investigations on the mass shooting. Extremely famous picture there. How evidence, how evidence, <laughs> however, evidence later uh, surfaced suggesting <laughs> that there may have uh, been a conspiracy after all. In May 2007, the Tampa Bay Times reported in an article entitled New Evidence Services in Kent State Shooting that Alan Canafora, who had been one of the nine students wounded during the shooting, had an audio recording which, inclu uh, audio recording which included a military order to fire on the protesters. The article states... Canfora played two versions of the tape, the original and the amplified version, in which he says a guard officer issues a command, right here, get set, point fire. The tape begins with static in the background and screams from the protester. The word point can be heard following by the sound of shots being fired. Canfora told reporters that the reel-to-reel -reel audio recording had been made by a student who was placed who had placed a microphone on the windowsill of his dormitory. Stan Pottinger told the press in 2007 that he doubts anything uh, he doubts anything was overlooked then. But he does. Pottinger was emblematic. Um, of the staff which made up the Nixon administration. On the Sat on Saturday, the 24th of November, 1973, in a Dayton newspaper, the journal Herald, Pat Ordovensky Or Or wrote an article, uh, Pottinger, proud of his job, sure of himself, in which the paper of uh, paper's official Washington correspondent stated, as an upper-level Nixon administration office official, he, Pottinger, projects his stereotype, his sideburns are just the right length, his suits an un unimaginative blue or grey, his voice exudes self-confidence without being overbearing. While Pottinger was developing his reputation as a key Nixon aide and civil rights crisis negotiator, a storm was brewing in the Nixon White House. The Watergate burglaries were eventually to be the nail in the Nixonian coffin, but the controversy had raged throughout. Uh, but the controversy had raged throughout 1972 and 1973. By October 1973, an article entitled "Bork Meets Aid," John M. Crudson reported on meetings between Acting Attorney General Robert H. Bork and members of the Justice Department, stating there were unconfirmed reports of future resignations in the department, possibly including that of Pottinger. Nixon's department didn't automatically mean the end of Pottinger's role. He was to stay on uh, when Gerald Ford took over in August 1974. Regardless of Pottinger's dealings with the various civil rights movement during this time at the Justice Department, by 1975 pundits were calling defeat on the supposed Nixonian efforts to fell discrimination. In an article in News Palladium of Michigan, Jeffrey Hart wrote about the failure of the Nixon administration to end discrimination, quoting previous remarks by Potting on the, on the Office of Civil Rights. We have a whale of a lot of power and we're prepared to use it if necessary. But while Pottinger was heading up the Office of Civil Rights, the way in which the department chose to utilise its power seemed sparing yet focused, with criticism of the Justice Department's efforts echoed around the media. All eyes became set on the first day of school in Boston. In September 1975, Pottinger was present for more clashes over desegregation, which were again about, which were again about to flare up, leading to running battles in the streets. 
Even though Nixon had stepped aside, the Watergate scandal was still in the news. The New York Times published an article on the 20th of February 1976 entitled Helms Won't Face Break-In Charges, which stated that Assistant Attorney General J. Stanley Pottinger, head of the Department's Civil Rights Division, said that he and other officials had carefully weighed evidence to prosecute Mr. Helms for civil, a civil rights violation. However, Mr. Pottinger told the news conference his congressional testimony is under review for possible perjury charges. With a Nixonian man like Pottinger in charge, the former director of the CIA, Richard Helms, appeared safe from prosecution over Watergate. Helms had also denied to the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence that the CIA had conducted domestic surveillance or supported political foes. On the late President Salvador Allende Gossens of Chile, in the, latter, the, in the latter New York Times article, it reads... Mr. Pottinger defended the decision not to prosecute Mr. Helms and others involved in the burglary of the photo studio in suburban Fairfax City, um, VA. It was partly owned by a, a CIA employee. I had the lead responsibility in this case for the last few months, Mr. Pottinger said. We have spared no resources, no time and no effort. I myself interviewed Mr. Helms. In fact, Mr. Helms was probably delighted to have been interviewed by J. Stanley Pottinger, a man with an abundance of links to the CIA. The murder of Orlando Letelier and the CIA's domestic surveillance. On New Year's Day 1976, part one of a two-part New York Times article was published entitled Study of Dr. King's Death Finds No Link to FBI. The article started off by stating, for nearly eight years, the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has puzzled many private citizens and even some government officials who were sceptical that James Earl Ray, an escaped convict with no obvious antipathy towards a black civil rights leader, had been the lone assassin despite Ray, Mr. Ray's own admission of guilt in court. In fact, the previous November, a Senate Select Committee on Intelligence had disclosed that the FBI had waged a significant campaign for at least six years to discredit Martin Luther King. For example, on the 21st of November 1964, the FBI sent the infamous suicide letter to Dr. King's residence, which also contained a tape recording of King having sexual relations with a woman other than his wife. The New York Times' Beverly Gage reported in 2014 that the so-called suicide letter was, uh, has occupied a unique place in the history of American intelligence, the most notorious and embarrassing example of Hoover's FBI run amok. There it is. That's the redacted version they originally released, and that's the uh, full reason uh, for one later released. The festering wound, which was the assassination of Martin Luther King, was to linger long in the memory, and it was to be J. Stanley Pottinger who was to put in charge of investigate fe investigating federal wrongdoing. The latter article states, The Justice Department's re-examination of the case continues, but J. Stanley Pottinger, head of the Civil Rights Division, said in an interview that so far the inquiry had up no evidence whatever of FBI involvement in the killing. Pottinger also asked the FBI not to comment publicly on the case, saying that it may negatively affect James Earl Ray's appeal. In 1997, Dexter King, the son of Martin Luther King, met with James Earl Ray and asked him, I just want to ask you, for the record, um, did you kill my father? Ray told King that he hadn't been responsible for the assassination of Martin Luther King, and this led to the King family filing a civil case in 1999 against Lloyd Jowers. Jowers had appeared um, on, on mm, a mistake, ABC's Primetime Live, where he claimed to have conspired with the federal government and the mafia to kill Martin Luther King Jr., The jury in the case of Coretta Scott King versus Lloyd Jowers, which was made up of six blacks and six whites, decided that the Memphis police and federal agencies had conspired to murder Martin Luther King. The King's family believed that James Earl Ray had been innocent. Um, the King's family's belief that James Earl Ray had been innocent in Jewish, with the Washington Post reporting on March 2018 that it pains my heart, said Bernice King, 55, the youngest of Martin Luther King's four children and the executive director of the King Center in Atlanta, that James Earl Ray had to spend his life in prison paying for things he didn't do. 
1976, the flawed investigation into FBI involvement in the murder of Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't the only high-profile assassination which Assistant Attorney General Stanley Pottinger was involved with. Around the 12th of September 1976, the government of Chile officially revoked the citizenship of Orlando Letelier, a prominent uh, Chilean diplomat, lawyer and economist who had been Chile's former ambassador to the US as well as serving as, the, as Minister of Foreign Affairs under Salvador Allende. Nine days after Pinochet's regime had revoked Letelier's citizenship, he was brazenly assassinated via a car bomb as he was driving along Washington's embassy row. A New York Times article on the 22nd of September 1976 entitled Opponent Chilean Junta Sla Hunter Slammed um, Slain in Washington by Bombing His Auto told of, his, of the recent reports of harassment by Chileans living in exile, stating, Recently, many of the 8,000 Chilean exiles in Argentina and the hundreds in Colombia have been subjected to severe harassment, including beatings from right-wing elements. Some victims say they saw the hands of Chilean secret police in the action. That's Orlando Letelier's car. Although the Chilean authorities officially called the murder of Letelier an outrageous act of terrorism, they were in fact responsible for the assassination. Two days after Letelier's murders, newspaper and murder, Letelier's murder, newspapers were reporting on the tip given to the FBI by, uh, by a Chilean who said that he recognized a Chilean secret policeman who disembarked from an airliner that arrived August 28th in New York from Santiago. The source had identified the high-ranking member of the DINA, the Chilean secret police aboard a Lufthansa flight. On the 28th of September, an FBI secret document entitled Condor Chilbum was um, uh, circulated, which began by stating, Operation Condor is the code name for a collection, exchange and storage of intelligence data concerning so-called leftists, communists and Marxists, which was recently established between co cooperating intelligence services in South America in order to eliminate Marxist terrorist activities um, in the area. In addition, Operation Condor provides joint operations against terrorist targets in member countries of Operation Condor. Chile is the centre for Operation Condor, and in addition to Chile, its members include Argentina, Bolivia, Paraguay and Uruguay. The assassination of a diplomat in the diplomatic centre of um, Washington, D.C. had rocked the U.S. security services, and the FBI were left scrambling for quick answers. The, the aforementioned FBI documents explained why Letelier's murder was most likely an officially sanctioned uh, action taken as part of Operation Condor, stating that a third and most secret part of Operation Condor involves the formation of special teams for member countries to carry out sanctions up to assassination against terrorist or supporters of terrorist organizations from Operation Condor member countries. For example, should a terrorist or supporter of a terrorist organization from a member country of Operation Condor be located in a European country, a special team from Operation Condor would be dispatched to locate and survey the target. When the location and surveillance operation had terminated, the second team from Operation Condor would be dispatched to carry out the actual sanction against the target. Operation Condor's member countries collaborated in many ways to support their allies, with member states using special teams to create false documentation necessary for successful operations. The teams who took part in this operation could be composed exclusively of individuals from one member nation of Operation Condor, or the team could be composed of a mixed group from various member nations involved in Operation Condor. Under Operation Condor, each of these member nations' intelligence services became entangled and culpable for the actions of their partners. This shared responsibility for the intelligence operations of participating countries involved in the operation made any potential international punitive actions or sanctions more difficult to achieve. The last part of the secret FBI document states, it should be noted that no information has been developed indicating that sanctions under the third phase of Operation Gondor have been planned or be carried out in the United States. However, it is not beyond the realm of possibility that the recent assassination of Orlando Letelier in Washington, D.C. may have been carried out as a third phase action of Operation Gondor. As noted above, uh, 
information available to uh, the source indicates that particular emphasis was placed of the third phase action of Operation Condor in Europe, specifically France and Portugal. This office will remain alert for any information available indicating that the assassination of Letelier may be part of Operation Condor action. If the FBI's concerns were valid, the U.S. intelligence services, close um, Latin American allies, were responsible for helping to form parts of the conspiracy behind the assassination of an official former diplomat on Embassy Row in Washington, D.C., the top men in the U.S. who were responsible for damage limitation were soon to meet. Eugene Proper was assigned to the case by the Department of Justice's Assistant U.S. Attorney General for the District of Columbia, Earl Silbert. Proper was the Assistant U.S. Attorney at the, this time and was described by Silbert as industrious and resourceful. The FBI had managed to scupper the investigation into the assassination of Martin Luther King, but this killing was going to be harder for them to hamper. Because Letelier had been a former Chilean ambassador, this provided him special protection under a special federal statute protecting diplomatic personnel. This provision meant that FBI involvement in the case was assured. In the book by John Dingus entitled um, uh, assassination on Embassy Row, the author describes Eugene Proper's realisation of the complexities of the case uh, he had been assigned. It's amazing. This is always me. As he, Proper, called professionals and friends in government agencies around Washington and read reports as they come in, a be bewildering cacophony of buzzwords began to engulf him. Communists, Allende, Marxist government, CIA role, military coup, concentration camps, torture, human rights, DINA, friendly intelligence services, IPS, left-wing think tank, comp simps, political assassinations. Before long, the FBI had investigated various leaders and all evidence pointed at DINA being the group who had uh, enacted the assassination. Although the question was being asked in the media of whether or not the Pinochet regime was responsible for the murder in Washington, D.C., the official response had been purposely designed not to link the two publicly. Whether out of convenience or necessity, the CIA were about to become involved in the investigation. But the CIA, under the leadership of George H.W. Bush, were also keen to set ground rules for their involvement. It is here that the conflicts between the CIA and the Justice Department were most glaring. The CIA did not want their sources exposed or to be on the record because, as Dingus wrote, the investigation might reveal that someone uh, the uh, CIA had worked closely with in Chile in the past was directly involved in the assassination. There he is. Uh, J. Stanley Pottinger forged a close relationship and uh, personal and professional relationship with George H. W. Bush, who was then sent director of the CIA. To bridge the gap the nego uh, and negotiate the special relationship concerning the Letalia case, J. Stanley Pottinger was brought in to oversee the negotiations with the CIA. John Dingus writes, on the 4th of on October 4th, J. Stanley Pottinger, Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, and Eugene Proper met with CIA Director George Bush and CIA General Counsel Anthony Lapham to hammer out a solution to the problem of CIA cooperation. Bush said the agency was willing to help if Pottinger and Proper could solve his problem about the executive order banning domestic intelligence gathering in the course of their discussions of development in the case as subject to share his discovery of Operation Condor came up. Bush said that if Attorney General Levy would write him a letter requesting that the CIA initiate an investigation of Operation Condor, they would have a solution to the quandary about CIA cooperation. Pottinger was leading a secretive renegotiation of the CIA's relationship with American government and the American people. The CIA were, was asking for legal permission from the Justice Department to investigate the activities of their Latin American counterparts and allies, including the intelligence services of Chilean regime, which had been originally installed by the CIA. 
Not only was George Bush looking for the CIA to scrutinize their own involvement in relationship to the member nations of Operation Condor's intelligence services, he was also using the opportunity to push for Pottinger and the Department of Justice to officially sign off on domestic surveillance being used by the CIA. In response to these requests, Dingus rep- explains, Over the next few days, Pottinger arranged for the presidential order, and he and Proper ironed out the details of a Justice CIA agreement for secret circumscribed cooperation. The CIA would provide relevant information from CIA files, but Justice could not use the information in court unless it had independently obtained it from a separate source. In case the outcome of the investigation turned on a particular piece of CIA information or CIA witness, the decision to use the information would be made by the president. In essence, Bush and Pottinger were using the assassination of Orlando Letelier as an excuse to grab sufficient, uh, significant powers of surveillance aimed at their own citizens. It also set a dangerous precedent precedence for the future scrutinization of CIA operations. On the 21st of October, Attorney General Edward Levy accompanied by Eugene Popper and Stanley Pottinger, met with Ishmael Letelier and Michael Moffat, whose wife was also, who also lost her life as a result of the explosion, Ronnie Moffat. Um, but behind closed doors, they were not working towards true justice for Orlando Letelier. They were working for the benefit of the CIA, a reoccurring theme in the life of J. Stanley Pottinger. From Iran with love. As the 1970s drew to a close, it was clear that Stanley Pottinger had become very close to the people manning the upper echelons of the CIA. In fact, Pottinger had been a useful tool for more than just a central intelligence agency. He had been a loyal servant and important tool of successive American political administrations who were trying to close the book on such major historical events as the assassination of Martin Luther King and Orlando Letelier, the Watergate breakings, the Kent State Massacre and Wounded Knee, among others. J. Stanley Pottinger had become the go-to guy to clean up the most sensitive issues of state. Pottinger had forged a niche for himself, and once leaving office in 1977, he was able to offer his special sets of skill, uh, offer his special set of skills, and his wider range of influential contacts, not only to the private sector but to intelligence agencies too. In the years after he left public office, Pottinger began working for giant companies such as Chemical Bank and Mead. But he would also join a reformed legal practice, Troy, Mailer, and Pottinger. While practicing as an attorney, Pottinger represented some very important clients, though some more uh, through some more very controversial events. Clients such as Cyrus Hashemi, who, alongside Pottinger, was to play a very central role in the Iran Contra scandal. In 1980, Pottinger was secretly recorded by the FBI as he organized the illegal sales of arms to Iran, breaking the arms embargo which was in force at the time. The same year as the FBI tapes were implicating Pottinger in running weapons, he also defended another illegal arms trafficker, Gerald Ball, who was accused of breaking the arms embargoes which had been placed against the apartheid South African regime. Both Bull and Hashemi were later assassinated by intelligence agents. It wasn't only Pottinger who was to play a central role in Iran-Contra scandal. Jeffrey Epstein was already swimming in very similar circles. In fact, Epstein and Pottinger were about to meet each other for the first time. In the next article, in the Pottinger series, we'll discover how J. Stanley Pottinger wasn't only helping his intelligence-linked clients to break various arms embargo, he had also got into bed with the CIA in the most literal sense possible. Right. Whew. I said the end there. That will be covered in the next episode of this series, The Pottinger Supremacy, The Road to the Takedown of Jeffrey Epstein, which should be, of course, well... It's, it's, it's below. I should have put a link in there already. The Pottinger identity is part of a series that will reveal important events which led to the takedown of Jeffrey Epstein. 
Although this author does not wish to see Ghislaine Maxwell vic- uh, verdict overturned, such a thing may happen due to a pre- to previous CIA involvement and collusion within the Epstein case. The true story of the takedown of Jeffrey Epstein has never been told until now. This series has taken almost a year of research, and in order to keep the standard of journalism, I need your support. That support keeps me independent and leaves me able to report the stories no one else can find. Hey, I do. I need your support. You can support me on newspace.com. You can support me on com. Become a patron, you know, buy me a coffee, whatever it takes, man. I, I, I need the support. Um, at the end of this article, which will, of course, be in the description, um, you will find this, uh, which is the Schism and News Paste Together, the Schism podcast and News Paste Together, uh, me and the Schism boys, and we go through all of the evidence. We do a news house. So every single source is in that article. And I promise you, if you actually look at how many sources are in this article, so in this one <laughs> paragraph here is one two three four five six different sources um yeah this article is sourced up the wazoo i've made it so that it's un it's you i've only included things that you cannot argue with because the evidence is overwhelming so so this is really important as you see all of those underlines there potting admit to reporters uh potting himself argue buddy but all of these will lead you to different links some of them are behind a newspaper paywall because of course they're um newspapers.com or new york times or something like that um I, I kind of do apologize about that, but th- you will find the, the what the articles say behind uh, any paywall. Um, one day I'd like to take photos of it all and link them in so that you can hover over the top and photos will pop up. But I could, don't have the time to invest into doing all of that stuff. This was a very important tale to tell, though. This was the start of Stanley Partner's life. And Stanley Partner's life had not been examined properly yet. And that's extremely important. You know, he, he was moving in extremely powerful circles. And in the next episode, he um, literally runs guns with Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein this is the 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 one of the central lawyers one of the two main lawyers Brad Edwards and Stanley Pottinger formed their practice together and represented the key clients in Epstein case and in the next episode of this it's 1980 1981 and he's running guns alongside Jeffrey Epstein illegally to Iran for the CIA understand what this exposes is massive uh, massive corruption is it this is um, an article that hasn't really a, a series that most of the series i write don't get discovered properly until later on i'm well aware of that it makes it really hard to uh make money and have some form of like financial uh, like pe- people even like new sites they wouldn't buy these articles from me because they're too controversial at the time and it'll cause them too much trouble. And that that's t- the type of trouble that happens in boardrooms hidden away behind closed doors. Not the type of trouble that you think either. It's like these people get have pressure put on them um, to not include something or to include something. And if they go too far, they rock boats. So they don't want to rock boats. So it pays not to rock boats. So I'm a boat rocker. The, you you don't get a job as a boat rocker. I've had to set up my own site. I've had to do all of those things because quite simply, no one will give me a job as a boat rocker. You know, I I, I work for sites that either um, pay me hardly anything or don't pay me at all. And I need help uh, in keeping up this sort of research and putting this sort of out. But, and I am, I am motoring. This article uh, by next year will include a massive video links in between that will be cut up documentary pieces and the documentary that's coming out around Christmas that will uh, accompany this uh, is going to be one of the best things I've ever produced. Um, and it, it it's not like the documentary um, didn't take a, a while to research and prepare because this whole series took me a year um i mean this has been a part of my life which has been crazy and uh and it's emotional reading through it is emotional i mean it's a serious um 
reading through an article like that uh is emotional i i i, I even like like when i read through it you won't hear it because i i'm controlling my voice um a bit but uh sometimes i break a little bit sometimes i feel like i want to have a little cry because i feel connected to these people i can feel connected to these events i've searched them inside and researched them inside and out and i'm a really emotive person i'm really like emotionally driven so i i i get connected with people certain characters um who i can like j- jive with who i can understand you know sometimes their stories just touch me just get right into my heart and then I got to tell the story. So it's quite good. That, that, that's a, a positive point. It'd be nice if uh, people could actually pay me for this sort of stuff. Uh, the majority of articles I've written that I've not been paid for. Full stop. That's it. Um, the only way I get support is from you guys. And it's really important that I continue along this road because I got a load of other investigations. I got a load. Of, there's been a load of injustice in the world and I am storming through it. So that was the Pottinger identity. We'll do a read through of Pottinger supremacy uh, probably next week um, and uh, read through of the Pottinger ultimatum after that. I mean, this is a, a sexy road. If you haven't read these articles beforehand, I mean, we're going to end up with watching the collusion like in right inside the collusion between cia epstein's victims council and epstein's council epstein himself in a way that is just unbelievable and parting his association with epstein that spanned for for decades decades close close and why hasn't this been? Why does nobody know about this? Hmm? Why doesn't everybody know? It, it should. I mean, Epstein case is one of the most interesting cases around. Why doesn't everybody know? Why doesn't this go around like wildfire? New information showing that the whole thing was a setup. Because it doesn't pay for people who have built their castles on sand to expose the the sand to water. It does not help. So people build up their own um, issues like that. You know, they, they, they say like, oh, the Epstein case was all this, all this, all this, all this, this is what happened. This is what happened. Uh, this person over here, this witness. In, in the third part of this, one of the, the main victims is going to be exposed, is exposed as telling loads of lies. And it exposes the entire case. But loads of channels, independent channels, independent news channels, have used her testimony to prove their other points, to prove um, that there's some sort of like evil uh, Israeli sort of thing behind it, or evil this behind it, or like satanic this or satanic that, you know, and backed up those theories and 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 entered into the the. Um, the world of epstein a load of talking points and and uh situations that are very doubtful ever happened because this person was in a relationship with stan pottinger this person who's an supposed epstein victim was in a relationship with someone who she knew was cia there's been a lot of people who have been you know uh, told a story and can't get out of it because ego ego for me to admit that I was wrong about the Epstein story in the first place, that that was hard because I had to admit it to myself. I, I I was lucky. I went through studying Pottinger, and that was slowly like, okay, I was wrong about this. Oh shit, I'm wrong about this. Oh, I'm wrong about this. Oh, I'm wrong about this. I'm wrong about the whole case. I believed it was simple. Oh, he was Mossad and he trafficked children, and that's. It's not as simple as that. It's not as simple as that. He was running the East Coast for the CIA, and the CIA does not want any questions about Jeffrey Epstein. So they made him into the Mossad. They made him into the Mossad. The Mossad and the CIA are in bed together anyway. They're in the same t- on the same side, doing the same thing. They are identical to what was happening in Operation Condor. Five Eyes, America, Israel, Britain, all Australia, etc. They're all in a linked intelligence service running operation that's very much like Operation Condor. 
And so they all do a little bit together anyway. But don't get it wrong. Look at the evidence. Epstein's recruited by the CIA through CIA infrastructure. He works in CIA programs like running guns um, in, in Iran-Contra. He runs the East Coast for the CIA. He runs the East Coast for the CIA. And then at the end, everybody calls him Mossad. Because what does that do? Well, it takes away all responsibility from the CIA. Because Mossad is all the way over there and you can't hold him accountable. But Americans can hold the CIA accountable for operations on their own soil. For the molestation of children on behalf of the CIA. So that's what we're dealing with. And you know what that means? You know, there's loads of people who have built their castles in the sand. Loads of them. They've built it on the backs of testimony that just is not true and is there so that their castles fall down. And once you've erected that castle and you've polished it up and everybody believes it and you discover the truth, you're like, shit, we we'll fucking hide the truth. Quick, hide it. Because that's water. The truth is just going to come and it's going to make my castle fall apart. And they become, all of these people, are either complicit or wanting to protect their ego. And that ego becomes the narrative that they've created that fitted a story that is going to fall. Fall once it's exposed as the truth. Because you can, you can theorize all you like. It's getting the evidence. And the evidence allows you to build up a picture that is inarguable. And there is a picture here that's inarguable. The CIA have their fingerprints all over this. And that Stanley Pottinger, John Stanley Pottinger, was a CIA man for a very long time, in bed with a girl from the CIA, doing business with people from the CIA, and eventually he was Epstein's neighbour, as well as being the gun running and everything else. You've all been sold a pup by people who have also been sold a pup. And they all protecting their golden pup. Because if they don't protect their golden pup, the fact that they're wrong on occasion gets exposed. And their legitimacy is eroded slightly. But in hiding and ignoring truth, their legitimacy is eroded even more. And they just don't realize it. Because that takes a little bit of perspective. It takes a little bit of being able to see what, how things develop in the future. Because every single conspiracy with the CIA falls apart. Every single one of them. Every single one gets exposed. Eventually, it only takes a matter of time. They used to take 60 years to get exposed. Now, they take months, weeks. It's out of control. They can no longer do an operation and keep it hidden. Because all eyes were on them. And they knew it. Now, everybody can smell when the CIA's been up to something. But we all know that it happened before. <sighs> and their fingerprints are all over the Epstein case. And the protection of Epstein. Or at least the protection of the information behind the Epstein case. And eventually the why he was killed now uh, someone tried to force me to say something else someone very f famous on the epstein case tried to get me to say something else in the last part of the pottinger series and we parted ways before i finished writing it because i was writing it it's one of the m many reasons but that was really this straw that broke the camel's back there was no way, and I think a lot of people know who I'm talking about here, there's no way that you're going to tell me what to write and what to say when I know it's not true. Zero way. I'm not going to do it. So there you go. Led me down a road, you know. Led me down a road. But the person who has been exposed and other people who have been exposed through these articles are now exposing themselves as being exactly the person I claimed them to be. So you've got to make the decision, your own decisions in life, on what you believe or not. And, you know, you've heard the terms question everything. Question the people most who tell you to question everything. That's what I say. 
it's really easy to say, you know, uh, you should always look for the truth and then not look for the truth or hide away from it because it suits your current relationships. It suits your current the current dynamics around you. It stops your your credibility being undermined by information that shows that you were once wrong. Everybody's once wrong. Everybody. I was wrong in the Epstein case. I was wrong in the Epstein case. I believed every single victim was telling the truth. I believed that he was a member of Mossad. Those two things were definitely wrong. Definitely. Definitely. And everybody see it soon. It's all going crum- crumbling down. Because like I say, every CIA operation fails eventually. It all comes undone. And I am watching this come unraveled. And soon, soon, the people who have told lies, the people who have been uh, obstructing the truth, the people who have been corrupt in this case, so that real victims, real victims get compensated, those people, those people are all losing the plot right now and exposing themselves, and they will continue to expose themselves. I don't really need to do that. This will happen by itself eventually. It's just good to... to uh, document the truth and and note so that you can note where it's happening when it's happening and who's doing it now a lot of that is cryptic a lot of it sounds cryptic and if you don't know me or you don't know my work it sounds mega cryptic um, but the fact is is that y- you keep following you keep listening to this this series you read the next two you can already go to newspaste it's already is a uh, um, Right near the top, you'll find the the banner for the plotting identity, plotting a supremacy, plotting ideas, ultimatum. Already go read them. You can watch the the news hounds where I go through each part, all the source material in detail. Three, two and a half to three hours per show of all the, the, the details. You can, you know, taking this information in all different ways, it will always lead you to the same conclusion. There is a massive castle being built in the sand and the people who have built it are about to have egg on their face it's best to be the first to notice that the egg is coming so you can duck out of the way personally I think and so that you can uh, write a true story I mean fuck the, the, fuck the proverbial just to be ability to have a conversation and it to be true it's amazing I watch some of these people who I know were involved in this and they spend all of their time lying they they know they're lying they know they're lying I can't even imagine what that's like you sit down and you're going to have to lie for two hours that seems mental to me and it looks mental once you know the truth so that'll mean that in in Five years' time, when people look back at this, they're going to see every single thing people said through a different filter, through a filter of stuff they now know that change what they see now, they're seeing currently. They're going to see something different. They're going to put on those glasses. They're going to see their lip faces all around the place. Because the whole thing, whole things, I think nearly the entire, everybody touching the Epstein operation, nearly the entire thing's been an operation. Of course it has. The first one, the first takedown of Jeffrey Epstein was an operation. Second one, of course it is. He was one of the biggest fixers for the CIA. Right? So there you go. That was it. Johnny Vedmore read through of the potting identity. Um, there's loads more coming over the next month. Loads. Please support the work. Uh, like, share, subscribe, comment. You know, do all of the things that you need to do to help this information spread around. I am doing my best to survive, um, but any help that you can give me is fantastic. I hope you enjoyed that and um, out. Young generation like uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, President of, Brazil, of uh, Argentina, and so on, certainly penetrates the cabinets.